Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to the India Conference at Harvard. This session today is on building a resilient healthcare system in India with our panelists, <coughs> Rai Chatterjee, Dr. Nachiket Moor, Ms. Amira Shah, and Dr. Praveen Gedam. Professor Vishwanath from Harvard School of Public Health will be moderating the discussion. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the India Conference at Harvard is co-hosted by both undergraduate and graduate students of Harvard University. We have a strong legacy of bringing together eminent leaders and experts across government, business, and civil society to enlighten and illuminate us regarding the most crucial matters and affairs facing India. In light of the current circumstances given COVID, we decided to go virtual this year in engaging with our audience and are leveraging our platform, which provide us, provides us a fertile ground for deep discussions while celebrating the intellectual diversity that forms the very foundation of our identity. Before starting today's discussion, I would like to briefly go over some housekeeping items. We will use the first 40 minutes of the session today for the panel discussion, following which we'll open up the session up to audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A function you see on your screen to post your questions. You will have an opportunity to upload questions. We encourage you to utilize this function if you spot your question, as opposed to re-entering it separately. Upvoted questions will appear on top of the pile and will be presented to the speaker. We respect and acknowledge the fact that there'll be differences in perspectives, but we humbly request our participants to kindly keep comments and questions respectful and civil such that we can all learn and grow from each other's ideas. We also request you to please tag us and use the hashtag ICH2022 to tweet and share your favorite quotes, insights, and moments from this session. Without further ado, I would like to pass it on to my friend and classmate, Kunal, to introduce the speakers from today. It is an honor for me to introduce such esteemed panelists for the session today. Each one of them have had a major role to play in the healthcare landscape of India and continue to be an integral member in this transformation journey to build a resilient health system. Let me introduce our first panelist, Dr. Praveen Gedam. He has graciously agreed to participate in the absence of Dr. Ram Sevak Sharma, who is the Chief Executive Officer of National Health Authority and had undergone a knee replacement surgery and wouldn't be able to join us today. Dr. Gidam is the additional Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Authority, mandated with the implementation of Ayushman Bharat, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, the world's largest government-sponsored health assurance scheme covering 550 million beneficiaries, and Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission, which aims to revolutionize the digital healthcare access for all the citizens. As second in command at NHA, he supervises the work of various verticals and coordinates with ministries, organizations, state governments, and other stakeholders. He has been in charge of public policy formulation, design, and implementation of the flagship healthcare schemes of Government of India. A career bureaucrat, Dr. Gidam, is also a qualified doctor before he joined the Indian Administrative Service. We welcome Dr. Praveen. Our second panelist for the day is a Ms. Mirai Chatterjee. Ms. Strategy is the director of social security team at the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is SEVA. She is also chairperson of SEVA Cooperative Federation of 110 women's primary cooperatives. In addition, she's responsible for SEVA's healthcare, childcare, and insurance programs. Ms. Strategy is also on the board of several organizations, including Public Health Foundation of India, Save the Children, Pradhan, among others. And in the past, she has served as a commissioner in the WHO's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. Welcome, Ms. Chatterjee. Our third panelist for, the, for today is Dr. Nachiket Moor. Dr. Moore is a visiting scientist and offers seminars in the health system design at the Banyan Academy of Leadership in Mental Health. He also serves as a commissioner on the Lancet Commission on Reimagining India's Health System. In the past, he was the India country director for the Gates Foundation and a member of the Confederation of India Industries Public Health Council. His current work is primarily focused on the design of national and regional health systems. Welcome, Dr. Moore. Our final panelist for today is Ms. Amira Shah. Ms. Shah is the promoter and managing director of Metropolis Healthcare Limited. Under her leadership, Ms. Shah led Metropolis into front lines of the COVID testing in India. She also advised and engaged with the Indian government to plan a response for the pandemic. She has served as the chairperson of FICI Health Services Western Subgroup that drives policy decisions at the center 
and is currently serving as a secretary at NAT Health, the Healthcare Federation of India. She is recognized as a global thought leader in healthcare industry and is passionate about welcome about women leadership and empowerment. Welcome, Ms. Amira Shah. Since we have with us so prestigious a panel, it only makes justice to the discussion by having a stellar moderator, who is Dr. K. Vishwanath. Dr. Vishwanath is a Lee Kum Ki Professor of Health Communication in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. He is also the Faculty Director of the Health Communication Corps at the Harvard Cancer Center. Dr. Vishwanath's work, drawing from literatures in social epidemiology and health behavior sciences, focuses on transnational communication science to influence public health policy and practice. Thank you all for joining in today and taking time out from your busy schedule to make it at the India Conference at Harvard. I would now pass on the baton to Dr. Vishwanath to moderate this discussion. Thank you, Kunal. Namaskar. Um, so let me first thank the organizers who have been working behind the scenes for so long. It's not an easy thing to do these days. Uh, and uh, usually we do the thanks at the end, but I do it in the beginning so that we don't run out of time. And so we really appreciate all the hard work they have done. Uh, and of course, uh, to the panelists, uh, I know some of you and I have heard of most of you, all of you, uh, and, and, and thank you for joining uh, this conversation on a Sunday evening for, for most of you, for all of you. Uh, I, I just want to uh, keep this um, uh, informal as a conversation uh, and, and start um, by getting to know, you know, each of you is very distinguished. We, we you know, people know you very well. Uh, but uh, just to start off with your own personal journeys, uh, which made you come or arrive where you are today, uh, just, you know, it, a few sentences uh, would be very helpful to contextualize the conversation we are going to have. Uh, so maybe we can start with you, Ms. Chatterjee. You know, so. Thank you very much. So my journey in public health began about 40 years ago, but some of the students may be interested to know that I was an undergraduate at Harvard University a while ago. 1982, class of 1982, and I majored in history and science. And um, I did a lot of the pre-med courses. And in fact, I was going to be a medical doctor, but then I decided to switch to public health. And I did my degree at Johns Hopkins under the great Dr. Carl Taylor and others who had cut their teeth actually on public health in India soon after our independence. And I was fortunate to join the Self-Employed Women's Association straight after I got my public health degree. And well, I've been there ever since. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, so let's go to uh, Dr. Praveen. You know, can you say a little bit about yourself? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, everybody. I, I, I'm a medical doctor, completed my uh, MBBS degree in the year 2001, and I joined the Indian Administrative Service in two, uh, 2002. And since then, uh, I have been uh, blessed and I've been lucky to uh, lead several uh, public health initiatives right from uh, uh, tackling of uh, bird flu pandemic, leading uh, important programs such as National Health Mission, Reproductive and Child Health. And with very focused uh, outcome-oriented uh, fashion, I remember uh, tackling uh, issues such as uh, home deliveries or malnutrition and uh, changing these indicators for a larger public good. And also uh, being in this service gives us an opportunity to work for public health in a very intersectional, at the intersections of various disciplines. So when we kind of uh, create a land use plan or urban plan or say water supply schemes and or manage events, I've been lucky to manage the event of Kumbh Mela. We, we get that perspective of uh, public health, which also comes from my medical background. And currently I am leading a couple of uh, national health programs, uh, which are very important. One is uh, 
आयुष्मान भारत प्रधानमंत्री जन आरोग्य योजना एंड द अदर वन इज आयुष्मान भारत डिजिटल हेल्थ मिशन ऑफ विच आई एम द मिशन डायरेक्टर एंड आई थिंक दिस ट्वेंटी इयर्स जर्नी इन द पब्लिक सर्विस स्टार्टिंग विथ माई मेडिकल एजुकेशन आई कुड प्रैक्टिस लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स इन पब्लिक हेल्थ and i am uh, very happy to be with all of you today thank you that was very helpful uh, can we go to ms shah so sure, thank you professor and and it's really my delight to be among such a, a prestigious panel here um you know uh, i grew up in bombay uh, decided to go to the us uh, for my undergrad um, and i was in austin ut austin uh, for a few years and i came back to india in 2001 when i was 21 because i was patriotic and i felt that those of us who are privileged uh, to grow up with a good education have to come back and contribute back to our nation um i came back at the time and decided to build a healthcare uh, enterprise with the idea of saying that all uh, access to testing quality of testing that we have in across the world why don't we have in india and that's how i started to build metropolis uh, 20 years ago bringing the all the test menu that it happens globally at the global quality levels to india um you know and that's what i've been doing for the past 20 years um uh, thankfully we've we've had a fairly good journey uh, along the way and um uh, you know even today metropolis is considered one of the most respectable brands uh, in the healthcare space um you know it's a uh, it's a it's a india is a challenging market Uh, and there are a lot of uh, trade offs and choices that all of us have to make at every day and every step of the way and what i'm most proud of is is really not the scale or the size we've achieved but the fact that we've done it our way we've done it the right way um and we we've, we've not taken shortcuts along the way and while today i'm i'm known more as a as a business person uh my deepest desire is uh, hopefully in, in the years to come uh, is to be seen um uh, much more as nachiket and miss chatterjee and um Mr. Gedar Manon for uh, is really more in the public health space uh, and the impact I can continue to make in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, Dr. Moore. So uh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Unlike, of course, the other panelists, I'm very much an outsider. Most of my career was in banking and finance. I've been in public health only the last few years, and. Um, very much a student very much somebody learning and these panels are such an opportunity to engage with people uh, my interest as was described earlier in my introduction is in trying to understand is there a systems perspective we can take to try and move us forward and uh, i'm looking forward to the discussion um, on this thank you uh, thank you so much um, you know um, so one of the It, it's very interesting the way the panel has been structured. So we have uh, people representing the private clinical enterprise uh, to public health policy making and 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 grassroots movements and an economist. Um, um, so I, I think I want to take advantage of that. You know that kind of a uh, multidisciplinarity that uh, Dr. Gaydon was mentioning. You know so. so you know if we were to you know the the conference's theme is really focusing over the next decade you know 20 30 so to speak and you know here we are uh, entering uh, the third year of the pandemic uh, which has uh, made all of us question uh, every aspect of life and 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 polity um, and, and and definitely health Uh, so i'm just wondering uh, uh, over the next 10 years say roughly what do you see what do you see uh, in terms of where india's health system is going uh, when i want when i say health system both uh, from health care perspective but also as a public health uh, system and, uh, and 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 what do you see as broad contours it's a very vague topic in some ways you know where do you see it going but from your own individual or disciplinary perspectives organizations perspectives you know where do you see we uh, see us going over the next 10 years in terms of broad contours uh, so we can start and i will ask each of you to weigh in on this and uh, and dr mor you are very modest but i will refuse to accept that you you are as good and as astute a student of health as anyone I know of, and you, I'm very familiar with your writings, especially recently as you have been working on these things. So let's start with you. Anna, so. 
So thank you for uh, getting me to start. I must say, you know, um, I'm um, quite concerned about the next 10 years because uh, my sense is that if indeed what you imply from your question is, if nothing is done and we continue as we have been over the last several decades, um, I, I worry about what we will end up with in 2030. Um, we are already seeing um, you know, so many pieces of the puzzle not coming together. Um, and um, if I look at out-of-pocket expenditures, they continue to be high. Uh, as states have gotten richer, uh, the economic survey has documented this, they have reduced their health expenditures, you know, which is a curious uh, outcome. Um, if I look at, for example, responsiveness of the health system, uh, you see all kinds of horror stories uh, emerging. There are, of course, islands of excellence. I'm not going to tell you that it's all bad, but uh, clearly uh, there is a lot more work to be done. And, and, uh, and one thing that I'm very eager to hear from others, but I, I have a grave concern about the corporate sector. The corporate sector uh, has remained tiny in India. It's about 4% of the overall market. You know, a single small healthcare chain in the US, um, Henry Ford, for example, has a total top line that exceeds the sum total of all the top lines of Indian corporate sector. Uh, that is certainly a big concern. I, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I come from a banking and finance background. I have not seen a sector like this in which the corporate sector is so puny and 95% of care is provided by providers who have fewer than five employees. We have a very celebrated information technology sector and, and you know, Dr. Giram and his team are doing some wonderful work to drive us forward. But any casual visitor to any hospital, large or small, well-known or not well, you'll be struck by the big files everybody is moving around. Um, there's you know, really virtually no usage of technology. Even the famed telemedicine that we talk about is nothing but, you know, a logistics appointment booking system that then puts a doctor at the other end of a telephone, maybe a video call. But if you ask, is there technology being deployed in the conversation, you don't see it. So, you know, net net, my fear is that if we do nothing, uh, we'll just get worse. Um, and, and many things that are not working well will continue to not work well. And with more money and more fragmentation, uh, we will start to see, you know, uh, more trouble. I mean, one more example, insurance sector. It's 7% of the economy. It's not growing faster than the economic GDP of the country, which means it remains roughly 7% for the last five years. Um, so, you know, many, many, I would say, concerning areas that I would want to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, you know, especially the corporate sector has been mentioned. So I will uh, come to Ms. Shah and, and tell us what you think from your perspective as we go forward over the next 10 years. How do you see us moving? So, um, you know, I would agree on some of the points uh, made, you know, but I think if I look at the next 10 years, um, the biggest thing that comes to my mind is that I think the government is uh, to try and take a task of being a provider of healthcare for 1.4 billion people is uh, the most unimaginable task. Uh, and to me, really, that aspiration itself uh, is too large uh, for anybody to do alone. Uh, and frankly, uh, with the kind of uh, varying requirements that you have in small villages, small towns, and then in cities, the urban poor, the urban rich, the urban middle class, they're all different. Uh, the kind of uh, chronic diseases, the kind of acute illnesses, the kind of waterborne diseases we have, the fact that you have so, so many people still living in villages, it is impossible for the government to do this on their own. And I really would wish for a time that the government, along with private sector, could truly come together as one collaborative being to actually map out and make a blueprint for what healthcare could look like and should look like five years and 10 years out. 
and work on bringing the resources of both. I mean, today, honestly, I feel that this burden is, uh, is carried very separately uh, and not together. Uh, and the, the lack of trust uh, and the trust deficit that we see between the two is actually what stops the collaboration. And the collaboration is what stops healthcare from moving forward. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't have resources, public and private, both have resources, both have thoughts, both have innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is the mistrust in my mind that crosses the bridge, uh, the deficit. Mm -hmm. um, the second point I just wanted to make was that you know, while it's very exciting that digital and technology can potentially play the opportunity of really making healthcare wide and accessible uh, and maybe affordable to many, many more people in India. What scares me the most is that today healthcare in India is so inconsistent and so um, volatile. Uh, you go to, you know, you go to three labs on the same day uh, and you give your sample and you will get varying different results. Uh, you go to hospitals, you will get varying different results. Uh, patients who are affording can go to good class, like uh, Nachiket said, islands of excellence and get what they need. But what about the rest of India? Uh, they are at the mercy uh, of public and provide and private providers offering extremely inconsistent um, so, uh, care. And to me, if you're going to take all of that inconsistent care and lack of good quality care and now put it into a digital system and spread it even wider, we are actually increasing the size of the problem. Uh, and if you're, it's garbage in, it's going to be garbage out. So I think while we use technology and digital to scale, it's absolutely essential that we also do hygiene and we clean up, you know, we put some minimum standards. We, 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 we create this, the relevance for, for a certain benchmark of quality. I mean, to give you an example, in the US, if you want to operate as a diagnostics player, you have to first be clear registered, which means you go to the national government, the government will come and check what you're doing, you get a registration number and then you start. And then you get audited regularly to find out what's happening. That is not the case in India. Today, anybody and everybody can start a path lab. There is no governance, no regulation uh, whatsoever, which means you could do what they call in India commonly a sink test, you take the sample and throw it in the sink and give a report what you want. Uh, that is scary that patients have to be exposed to that. I think so. Therefore, my only point is that quality and minimum standard benchmarking is as essential as accessibility and both have to go hand in hand at the same time. Otherwise, I think the problem we'll have later, 10 years later, will be much larger than the one we have today. Thank you, Misha. You raised some very interesting, important issues. I want to come back to them uh, and, and, and uh, uh, also connect them to what uh, Nachiket was saying. Uh, but let's go to Dr. Gidam. I think the issues of policies have come up both in Dr. Moore and uh, Misha's comments. So where do you see us? And you are sitting in what we call as a cat perch, say, you know, the perch you have uh, in, in, in influencing some of these uh, directions. So tell us where we are going in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think uh, if you see the national health policy, which was released around five years ago, it clearly uh, recognized the fact that we are not uh, really doing the best in healthcare. And uh, the issues were clearly highlighted. And uh, as was pointed out by the earlier speaker, we have a huge private sector, but extremely fragmented people, you know, establishments with five and 10 persons, and they are catering to almost two thirds of the healthcare in India. And uh, despite all its effort, uh, despite all its economic growth, uh, the government's contribution remains almost one third of total healthcare. So this fact has been recognized and it has also been a very uh, strategic shift in the uh, policy making to go hand in hand with the private sector. And this uh, scheme of uh, Aishman Bharat PMJY is one such example where we recognized that, okay, yes, uh, our public capacities are lacking and it we should ramp up it, ramp it up, no doubt about that. We must ramp it up, but it's not going to be a short term in possible in the short term. So we have to take uh, private sector along and uh, start taking their help. And we have seen several initiatives like uh, a new hospitals and medical colleges coming up on PPP basis. Uh, and issue is not only about infra, this is, uh, but it's also about HR. We have one of the lowest ratios of doctors, nurses, and paramedics in the world. 
And I remember that when I was doing uh, medicine, we had around 12,000 uh, MBBS seats in India. Now they are almost six times, uh, 25 years down the line. So, I mean, we are taking steps, no doubt, but uh, for the country of the size of India, we, we need to remain on toes for a uh, couple of decades to come so that we don't uh, lose this track. Thankfully, despite all its negative effect, COVID pandemic has brought back the focus uh, of the government and in fact of the society as a whole on healthcare. And I think we should not let this momentum go. We have to work and of course the various pertinent issues raised, regulation, fragmentation and quality of care. It's, it's way too complex uh, to be described in a short interaction, but I think we have to work uh, in a 360 degrees fashion to ensure that uh, India's healthcare delivery capacity goes on increasing. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and We'll come back to, again, one or two of those issues. Uh, I think there are some consistent issues coming up. Uh, Ms. Chatterjee, you have a, also a very interesting and unique perspective from the grassroots. What do you think? Thank you very much. So I'm going to start on a little bit more of a positive note because I have the benefit of looking back over 40 years. And I remember when I was writing my senior thesis as an undergraduate, our infant mortality was 120 per 1,000 live births. Um, and we surely have come a long way, which is not to say that uh, we don't have a long way to go. But I remember when I began to work among informal women workers in the villages and mohallas of Gujarat, what we saw was mainly a family planning system and hardly a health system or public health system. So um, I do have the benefit of that historical perspective and to see that we've reached point as a nation and many other nations, by the way, including the United States, are not at that point. At least at the policy level, we accept universal health care. Um, as Dr. Praveenji has mentioned, it is part of national health policy. Um, Nachi Keth and I were honored to serve on the high-level expert group on universal health coverage. And there's quite a, a, a clear direction there. And I think that direction has not changed. So um, some good steps forward for sure. Um, but I would like to say from the point of view of people at the grassroots, uh, there are better services. Just before this webinar, I actually spent several days in villages, in remote villages in the north of Gujarat in Sabarkanta and a tribal district. And I was pleased to see the health and wellness center functional you know, patients coming. I mean, we wouldn't have seen that 40 years ago, that's for sure. Um, but having said all these positive things, I agree with the earlier speakers, we certainly have a long way to go, no question about it. And I think one of the things we will have to look into, which unfortunately we have not done enough, is focusing on primary health care and particularly comprehensive primary health care. I would like to point out from the point of view of poor working women of India, we have very little on mental health. We have very little focus on aspects of women's health like infertility, prolapse of the uterus, things that concern women that don't seem to concern our policymakers yet. I think one day they will. And also occupational health because most of the people of our country are working people contributing actively to our country's economy. So they deserve better. I agree with the former speakers on the issues of quality and regulation. I think that it's high time that we set up standards for both the public and the private health sectors. Um, I also would like to see us, and I think we are moving in that direction, but a little too slowly for our comfort, frankly. I would like to see greater investment in public health um, in the report that Nachiketh and I were involved in, well, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. we had said 2.5 to 3% of GDP. We're nowhere near that. Um, and I think, you know, if COVID hasn't taught us that, then what will teach us? Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I think there has to be a continuum of care 
uh, while I mentioned the health and wellness centers, and we know about the Pradhan Mantri Jana Rogya Yojana, we don't see a clear connection between these. These seem to be in little boxes. And actually, from point of view of poor people and all citizens of the country, in fact, these need to be a continuum from primary to secondary to tertiary care, um, if it is to make sense. And if all of this is to be affordable and sustainable in the long run. I'd also like to uh, take up the point on partnerships. I think we're going to see many more partnerships. The pandemic has taught us that neither the government nor the private sector alone can deliver. There's one more sector, which is the people sector, which is the citizens of our country who were second to none, particularly the women of our country who were out there on the front lines, even though their families said, please don't go. They were there serving others at the cost of their own well-being. So I think partnerships between public, private, and the people sector are going to be critical in the next 10 years because no one can do it alone. Neither can people do it alone. Obviously, we need the stewardship of our government. We need the support of the private sector as well. And one last thing I want to say, I mean, there's a lot to say, of course, but quickly um, is that, you know, while we welcome digitalization and health records and the national digital mission and so on, I think it's important also uh, to have a reality check. We want these tools in people's hands, the health records and their own personal data should be in their control. Uh, I'm sure government is thinking a lot about privacy, but it's it's more about how can we empower citizens to take control over their whole health and well-being. I mean, how long is the government and the private sector and everybody? Health is not something to be delivered. It's something that each citizen of our country has to be empowered with information. We have to deal with the information asymmetric question, and we have to think of creative ways to implement so we reach the last and the poorest of our citizens, be it a tribal in Sabarkanta or in Nagaland or in Kerala or where, wherever. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, you know, I, we can spend the next six hours uh, going over each of these issues that you have raised so insightfully and astutely. There's some common themes coming up, right? So one is the role of technology. Um, and uh, uh, fragmentation you know, of the system itself and lack of coordination, um, or at least some, some, some sort of a overlapping role among, among different sectors, uh, quality of care, consistency and quality, which, uh, you know, uh, even we are struggling here, you know, so because this is a huge issue, it continues to be an issue. Uh, uh, mental health, uh, and uh, of course, HR, you know, you, um, I, th I think the capacity uh, in terms of human relations, uh, human resources, and a human capital uh, continues to be a major issue everywhere. And of course, investments in different health. So, but, um, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, where to go next, and you know, one issue that keeps coming up, I I'm so tempted because I have to start with this, uh, is, is the role of women. Uh, you know, and the centrality of the role. You know, our own data. Even recently, we were doing some analyses um, and, and and some data collection. You know, uh, showed you know the the difficult role they have in in in, uh, um, in 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 really managing and navigating through the uh, healthcare system and also health of the family. You know, so um, and and there's a great intersection between technology and access among women. Uh, we have done studies in other countries showing these inequalities in communication, especially when it comes to issues of uh, gender. So I, 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 maybe I, I, I want to start with that, given how important and central it is. Uh, how do you see we, we, we privilege uh, the role of women uh, in this sector? Uh, and how do, we, how do you see what role they play? And, 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 and how do we work towards promoting access uh, it, it goes for all the levels from inside, you know, with power in terms of within the household to all the way to the to the systems level. Um, so I, I just want to start with you, Ms. Chatterjee, on that issue, and then we can see if others want to jump in. Sure. Well, both for women and for people at the grassroots, I think what's very important, which we've not been able to do, is 
to have several consultative processes. So we actually find out what are people's priorities and needs. Let me give you one example, since I mentioned, I was just a few days in a tribal village. There's a high level of malnutrition in this block. It's Poshina block of Sabarkantha district. And it is 100% tribals, pill tribals. And there is a nutrition rehabilitation center at the community health center, the hospital about 30, 40 kilometers away. And women are not ready to take their malnourished children there. They want to do anything to make their child survive, but they can't go there. And why can't they go there? Because they have other children, they have buffaloes, they have various other care responsibilities, household responsibilities. I'm giving this an example because I think we have not consulted with them. We have not gone down to the grassroots and see where are the gaps? How can we close the gaps? So if we're serious about closing the gaps, in fact, I miss saying this, I think there's huge inequities and inequalities in health, unfortunately only widened during the pandemic. And of course, women are among the worst sufferers. That's why you rightly brought it up. But if we want to do about something about it, then organizations like my own would be only too willing to sit with government to discuss to help bridge these kind of gaps and understand what is it from their perspective that they would like. I think also partnerships with the self-help groups and their federations, unfortunately in India, we have many, and cooperatives and unions like SEVA and others, we're willing to partner and sit together and also help in capacity building and also changing mindsets. One major problem we have in our country because of patriarchy is that women are the last to seek care. They'll do anything for their husband's care and their children, but when it comes to themselves, it's a little too late. So working together, I think, to bridge and close the gap of inequity. I want to come to you, Misha, on this issue. So there is this huge unorganized sector, you know, so, and the organizations such as SEVA have been doing, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, amazing contributions in terms of you know, trying to attend to their needs. But the corporate sector also has a significant role to play. In, and I think you know, um, given that a number of women are now working also outside home, you know, they always work at home unpaid. You know, so they're also working outside home and uh, uh, are a part of this employment task force now. So what role can corporate sector play in, in advancing those issues, women's issues? So, I mean, I think if we look at, I think there are two, three things that the corporate sector could do, which is specifically in healthcare, right? I mean, I think today the corporate health sector, probably along with organizations like SEVA, know most about what's happening in healthcare in India, right? Because everybody is across the country. And this is what I was referring to earlier when I was talking to public and private working together. It, it's not so much about government coming out with a tender and saying, okay, now who's going to build this hospital? And then private comes and bids for it and L1, you know, whoever wins. When I'm talking about true collaboration and partnership, I'm talking about the expertise of both coming together. Uh, like Ms. Chatterjee suggested that Seva will be happy to sit with the government and say, how do we close the gaps? And I think if we were to put that knowledge together, I think we would be able to find far more innovative solutions and a blueprint for planning for the future versus that planning being done alone by the government and the private agencies only as a fulfillment. So that was the first point. But coming back to your point on, on women, I think if, if healthcare sector was able to use its CSR monies, I'll tell you today, there are so many people, we have CSR monies, but because of the CSR law, we are not able to use it towards healthcare. So today we have knowledge of healthcare. We know there is a gap in healthcare, but we cannot use our own CSR money towards healthcare. So like this, so many organizations who are all doing small, small projects, Everybody has to deploy their own CSR and everybody's doing something small. But the effectiveness of those small projects is not actually having an overall effectiveness because everything is being done in small pieces in different geographies. So somebody is tackling the problem of hygiene in one village. Somebody is tackling a problem of malnutrition in another village. And what we know is that unless you holistically adopt a village and you work on five, six areas at one time, you're not going to see an overall area of improvement in that village. So I feel that there can be still an area of improvement where all of us can put our resources and monies 
towards specific goals like women's improvement in healthcare mm-hmm. uh, in a more collaborative fashion rather than everybody doing their own projects and i think using the 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 women as a channel uh, to influence what happens in their homes and in their households whether we can create some sort of a uh, financing program for them whether it is an incentive structure or whether it is an education towards women they can definitely play that biggest influence a role but i think we need to be very clear on what policy is going to drive to inspire them to continue to play that role in an effective and accessible manner i think technology can be a big player there uh, because i think it can remove some of some of the inequities however we need to bring the financing into some sort of equality because while abdm is attempting to do that for a large number of people and has managed to do that for some amount of people it goes back to my original problem about the lack of consistent care amongst providers right and and therefore even in any in any structure uh, with abdm also you will find that there is uh, unfortunately uh, uh, leakages you know there will be private private providers who try to take advantage of the situation uh, so i think it just goes back to the policy of what we are trying to accomplish for women and i think we can use technology in a way great thank you um But to get them, I think uh, the issues raised by Ms. Chatterjee and Ms. Shah around these, uh, you know, um, issues of around women and equity, you know, certainly plays a role, you know, uh, provide a role for the government, you know, which is really critical. From your perspective, how do you think you want to advance that? So, yeah in fact uh, i would start with the fact that you take care of health of women you take care of not only her health but health of the family and ultimately the society so the importance need not be in fact even discussed it's it's way too evident and i think one way that government can do is to fine tune its policies in a way that women are benefited taking the example of nrc that was given i remember uh, starting the first nrc in a non tribal area of maharashtra in latur district around 15 years ago and the same problem of women not willing to come with their kids malnourished kids for staying for 15 days or so and then we fine tuned our policies we understood went to the root cause understood that they are there because they they have to go for some kind of wage earning and also to take care of household work so we kind of uh, started giving wages and also started home based nrcs and all those fine tuning has to be done if you see certain policies such as icds or asha these are very specifically women centric uh, policies which government has come out and you have to look beyond health also health is the outcome of so many factors so very uh, proactive uh, steps such as reservation of women in local self government i think it is also it also needs to be discussed because the you empower local uh, women leadership they take care of the issues of the women and i think we i still agree that we have a long way to go but figures show that you know things are improving i i talk about my couple of schemes Uh, 48% of uh, uh, benefits so far under the Ayushman Bharat have gone to women we certainly very close to half way mark and similar figures if you see the covin dashboard it's a public dashboard uh, when it comes to say vaccination so i think uh, we are changing for better and we need to keep accelerating in that direction thank you um i want to shift slightly and and go to dr moore um so um the issue of technology keeps coming up and sometimes it's a little puzzle to define what we mean by it it could go all the way to interoperability of systems that are that have to be connected you know to to address some of this fragmentation to uh, digital inequalities you know um you know and, starting within a household all the way to uh to to uh, you know uh, communities and neighborhoods uh, but at the same time we are hearing a lot about uh, so called uh, you know telehealth digital health telemedicine uh, and 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 variety of these uh, you know words that are coming up and then uh, you have been writing um so accurately and insightfully about ai and and where will that lead us or not lead us uh, so I'm, i'm just curious um what you think what role does technology play 
particularly in, in India, given you, you have also said, you know, we, we don't have the legacy problems that those of us in the US face. So can you just start us off? What should we be thinking about when we talk about technology? So. No, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, just one I, on the previous question, I cannot resist making one important Please. point. Please. Uh, you know, we have a little bit of a paradox in the way we think about women, right? One is, of course, we want to focus on women. I certainly worry about building health systems that are narrowly focused on one condition or one population group. I think that has not led us down good paths. Uh, you know, I have a paper under review which talks about to build a good maternal and child health focus health system, we should not focus on maternal and child health because it just takes us down a very awkward pathway. But the ASHA, you know, and many health workers at this time, underpaid, undercompensated, overworked. So while we are working towards women, the very women that are providing the service, we are not able to actually take care of them. Uh, very differently from what many other countries have done. Thailand, for example, began in the same way as we did, but trained, invested, paid, you know, and built a whole cadre of nurses, doctors out of this workforce. Um, so anyway, so just a thought there. In terms of technology, quickly, you know, I want to, I do believe technology has a role, but I think, and this is really where some of the thinking on mindsets needs to go in. The view we have taken, and I think some of the quality issues that were mentioned comes from that, that somehow the medical profession is a black box. You get the right degree, right? And now you can pursue just all based medicine. You know, you can say whatever you want, whatever guidance you give. The license gives you license to do what you need to do. If you don't have the license, you cannot even, you know, mention uh, the word medicine. I think technology allows you to go in a very different direction. Right? Today we know that the UK GP, one of the highest trained primary care doctors in the world, under refers cancer by 70 percent, right? Because you know training is no longer the adequate tool uh, and memory. Uh, whereas you can go with a much wider population of providers, um, community health aid, dental hygienists, you know, empowered pharmacists. You know, several uh, countries empower pharmacists to treat chronic disease. Um, and make sure that they stay within a certain frame. So, and use technology to give them real-time guidance, to give them the opportunity. And for example, I'm very excited about the work Dr. Gedam is doing on the National Digital Health Mission, because that, that can become the pipe through which we can really build a workforce that's out there. Uh, that is very different from the old idea of, let's have the doctor, let's have the MD. And that's the only person that can actually solve our problems. So I, I, I think we have to reverse the emphasis. Instead of saying, let's do telemedicine, where some remote person is talking to some central person, God knows where, for a conversation, for a consult, we reverse that. Then now, a lot of the capability is right there to do what is needed to be done. Uh, and technology is supporting the individual, not replacing the individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Due to the amazing review we have been receiving about the panel discussion, we are extending it for about another 15 minutes. So we can continue the discussion for the next 10 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions yes. from the audience for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. I have already been asking some of the questions uh, from the audience too. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, so I hope it is okay with the panelists to extend it. Uh, you know, so I, I know it's a Sunday evening there. Uh, so you know, just to build on the on, on what uh, Dr. Moore was saying, you know, um, about technology and how to reverse, um, 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 you know, our, our mindset on it and how to think about it. Given that it is inevitable and 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 uh, some kind of a technological. Um, involvement is inexorable. Uh, 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 again, we have to continue to wrestle with it. I, I think if we don't shape it, I think technology will shape the healthcare, right? So we have to get our arms around it. So I'm just curious, uh, Michelle, what do you think from a 
from your perspective, how technology can help, uh, you know, with, with, you know, you are in somewhat of a unique perspective here, given that you are spread in different countries and different parts of the country, and you, know, and you are also raised this issue of quality and consistency. And uh, how do you see uh, health technology playing a role in this? So, I mean, I think definitely some of the things that are being planned uh, by the government, um, you know, with Mr. Kedam and others and Mr. Sharma as well, are very exciting. I think the idea of creating a super highway, creating a health stack uh, that allows for interoperability of data, that allows for the patient to have charge and empowerment of their own data, I think can be very exciting. But if we can connect the dots between what Ms. Chatterjee said, what uh, Mr. Moore said, and what Mr. Ginnam said they're doing as well, I think imagining a time where not only treatment, like uh, Mr. Moore said, can be done by theoretically a pharmacist or somebody else in that local market with the aid of AI. The other area that could be added to that very significantly is preventive healthcare. Because as a country, if we keep chasing our tail in solving for illnesses and chronic uh, illnesses, uh, we need to find a way to move to a space of better prevention and not only treating the cure. So if we could move to that situation where technology is empowering each of us with our own data and with the assistance of the people around us in our community, that could be an ASHA worker, it could be a pharmacist, it could be somebody else. And that allows us to take better care of ourselves overall. And then obviously go to people where we need help for acute care in our market. I mean, I think that could be a time where India would be able to move beyond its fundamental challenges of lack of people, lack of training, lack of skilling. Because frankly, if we go down that traditional route, I find it really difficult to envision a time that we are going to have adequate skilling in India. I mean, the numbers that we are at, we have to make, you know, a, a hundred X change uh, to be at a place where we will feel that manpower resources are enough or infrastructure is enough. So we'll be constantly five steps behind where we need to be. Uh, and I think technology can help us leap and get to a place that we don't have to make those investments, but make different investments to still solve the same purpose and hopefully still come out ahead. Um, so I think it really goes back to the point of, uh, of not providing, of not delivering, but empowering. Uh, and, and technology can play a very significant role. So Dr. Gidham, you know, this, uh, um, I think your name has been invoked and uh, uh, a couple of times in our discussion on the technology and the schemes that the government is running. Uh, and you're you're leading a major effort on, on digital health as a part of the National Health Authority. So tell us about it. What do you think about it, and uh, and how can we capitalize on on India's lack of legacy problems, uh, as as Dr. Moore has put it earlier, uh, to to move forward on this. So. Yeah, it's a very exciting area actually to work. I've been part of uh, you know witnessing this thing. It, it, uh, I'll start with a disclaimer that it is not going, uh, it's not a replacement of what we should uh, basically focus on, ramping up of the impra and having better, I mean, more number of uh, manpower doctors and nurses in the field. But till we reach a kind of satisfactory level, what we see currently is a plethora of doctors in uh, Delhi and Mumbai and uh, lack of them and people going to quacks in some backward districts. So this uh, equitable distribution, even though through virtual platform, is one very quick, uh, uh, low-hanging fruit that I see technology will enable us uh, to plug. And Indians have been very tech-savvy, if I can say so, with almost uh, 500 million smartphones, which they are consuming data, which is uh, through inter uh, mobile, which is more than US and China put together. So I think uh, Indians, including the poorest of poor women, tribals, uh, and those uh, uh, socio-economically backward people, they are now very, very comfortable with uh, digital technology. And this is our strength, which we have leveraged for uh, uh, initiatives such as UPI. So, uh, and I see AI, uh, being a big player in the coming uh, few uh, years because India has that data which probably no other country perhaps except China can have. Also, in addition to preventive care, I see it, it's, it's huge importance in public health care. Uh, 
US and such and other countries, they have problem of very uh, siloed digital systems. You can't share data from Sana to Epic from one hospital to other. But the very platform that we are building here and which have been successfully tested and we are all set for scaling it up, it, it, uh, it, the basic is interoperability, common standards. So this problem of fragmentation of healthcare system and digital health providers, it's taking, taken care of by design. And other thing which we have done is to put uh, the control of data with the patients. Uh, again, there are certain developed countries where it is very difficult for even patient to access its own data, but that's not going to be the case here. So I see it a kind of great transformative tool which will facilitate access to quality and cheap healthcare. And it will give choice to the patient uh, by selecting which one it wants to go. We are not, we are going for kind of de-Amazonification of this uh, digital platform where the silos will be broken. Uh, broken. And we, we are actually going uh, forward to take this example of unified health interface in the payment ecosystem um, forward in this particular. And furthermore, uh, uh, advantages that I can foresee we also are uh, developing a policy for anonymizing, aggregating this data from these disparate sources so that we can get epidemiological patterns, we can get uh, trends such as anti Imagine we have now MD of Metropolis, Ms. Shah here. All these labs, their uh, culture sensitivity reports, just for example, if we collect at one place, we get to know, okay, this particular month in this particular city, this particular microbe is sensitive to this uh, uh, antimicrobials and resistant to this. So it changes the whole uh, way in which healthcare is delivered. The cost comes down, side effects come down, and we can use our limited resources in the best possible way. So I think uh, we are all set for that uh, uh, leapfrogging in the area of digital health. And one advantage that we have is we don't have problems of legacy. Right. Thank you. Uh, I would not offer the US uh, system to anybody as, as a model, uh, given the challenges we are having. Uh, uh, so certainly I think it is exciting to hear uh, some of the initiatives in India and the potential there. Uh, so. You know, one issue that keeps coming up, maybe, you know, I also want to open it up for questions coming um, at, at a great pace from the uh, audience uh, for this webinar. But there's one issue that keeps coming up. Uh, that issue is that of HR, you know, uh, and human resources. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, there were some statistics that were given earlier, the number of, uh, you know, MBBS uh, type doctors we are training. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, Increasingly, we are also talking about task shifting. I think there is a growing realization uh, uh, that, that we have to really train a cadre of people so that not everybody has to go to a surgeon and a specialist for every little thing. Uh, and, and pharmacists has come up, uh, the role of labs have come up, um, um, and again, at the grassroots level, um, uh, I, I do uh, agree that you know pharmacists play a big role, but but I think that, and and of course uh, Asha's uh, have been always talked about. So what do we? What can we? What is required over the next few years uh, to to work towards that kind of a task shifting, where we go from highly specialized trained people doing everything uh, to really maximize, amplify, and and. Uh, broaden uh, healthcare delivery through, through trained uh, people? It's a very broad question. There's no simple answer to this, but, uh, uh, but I think it, this, this has come up and it will continue to be a challenge given the 1.4 crore uh, billion people in India. So maybe Ms. Chatterjee, shall we start with you given your perspective at the ground level? You know, so. so if I was in a position to decide, I would put my money um, into more frontline workers. We have suggested um, long 10 years ago that there should be at least one Asha, two Ashas per village. So one Asha for about 500 households 
if we want to deal with both communicable and non-communicable diseases, mm -hmm. and we don't see that happening yet. I would like to say, I think that, you know, human resources, our people are our greatest strength. So I think we need to think of our people, the citizens, hardworking citizens of our country, resourceful citizens of our country, as our greatest strength, not a liability. And this was proved again during the pandemic because it was the citizens of this country in a decentralized manner who rose to the occasion and showed that they could deliver. They could take care of each other. They could take care of people. That's why I'm suggesting that we invest in ASHAs, but they need to have more skills. Their knowledge base and skill base needs to be upgraded. And then those of us who are also run primary health care programs at the grassroots level, and we have our Arogya Sakhis and so on, are also willing to, again, partner and join hands. Because as we've been saying again and again in this vast country of ours, no one can do this alone. But having said that, I think we need to invest much more in nurses. Um, and I think also policies to promote local people. You know, now we have many more young women and men, young people, who've at least done up to high school level. Um, and they're local, they're, they're, they're quite happy if they're paid better than what ASHAs are paid now to actually serve their own communities. Mm -hmm. And I saw this a few days ago again. And also when they're local, whether they're doctors or nurses, they're more likely to stay than do what we in India call up down, uh, where more time is spent getting to the place and less time is spent serving people. I also think we do need to invest in doctors and particularly in some of the states which are so underserved. I think one problem we have, and maybe Dr. Pravinji will be able to speak to this, is that we continue to export doctors. I mean, we're not able to retain them in this country. I mean, Dr. Amira is a rare person in this regard. So, you know, we that's, that's a major, we bleed doctors. We train doctors and nurses, but they go to the Middle East or wherever they go to. So then maybe we need to train many, many more. I would like to see in every taluka more nursing schools, more schools for paramedics to train our vast youth, who we call our demographic dividend, but let us not fail them. They're ready to work if we're ready to uh, create an environment for them to work and to be trained and paid properly, as right. Nati mentioned. Right. Uh, I, I'm sure, uh... Dr. Praveen, your name will keep coming up on this issue. So I'm going to come to you last uh, uh, on this uh, human resource issue. Uh, Misha, you know, um, we, we focus a lot on doctors and nurses and certainly the centrality of, uh, um, or at least the criticality of ASHAs at, at the grassroots level. But, you know, running a lab, for example, also requires enormous technical talent and scientific talent, right? It's just, I mean, you, you, uh, mentioned more than once the issue of quality and consistency. So from your perspective, uh, how do you see the human resource issues being addressed in this area? So, uh, you know, I, I concur with some of the things mentioned, I won't repeat them, but additionally, I think there are two important points that, you know, there used to be a time where being a doctor or a nurse uh, or a scientific person in India was a hugely aspirational thing. Uh, people felt proud when somebody in their family, uh, you know, was a doctor or a nurse because you were helping people, uh, you were aiding the community, uh, you know, you, it meant that you were more educated and purposeful. Uh, I'm not so sure that is the case anymore. Um, and I think uh, if I talk to all the doctors I know, and I know a lot, uh, they tell their own children, don't become doctors. Uh, so what has gone wrong, right? Where have we failed? And I think part of it is the heroes in India today uh, are the people who make the maximum money. The heroes in India are not the ones who add value to the community. Um, and I think even if you look at COVID, uh, where has our health ministry been celebrated? Where have our COVID warriors been celebrated? Mm -hmm. uh, we have not. Uh, and I think if we have to make first healthcare an aspirational subject where you know that you will be respected in society, you will be considered uh, that you know you have done something uh, for the community and not just yourself. So to me, motivation, aspiration is a very, very big part of it. Uh, and I think that is very easy to, to do. It's not that hard to do. It just requires a few tactical moves um, you know, uh, to actually make that change very quickly. Uh, it's a low-hanging fruit, if you ask me. 
Um, the second thing is the problem of medical education. Uh, medical education in our country has been highly regulated, and I'm sorry to say, but also in, in some cases corrupt. Um, you know, there is a lot of things that happen on the ground uh, where the, the deserving candidates don't get a merit, uh, you know, merit seats. Uh, people have to pay money uh, to get in to become doctors. They leave medical college uh, with huge debts, uh, you know, on their heads. Uh, and then they land up going and doing poor practices when they're practicing because they have to pay off those debts. So we are creating a cycle from the start in medical education that then tortures the Indian doctor for many, many years to come. Um, so I think, you know, if we go back to the root also of trying to get more people into the medical education system through the motivation and aspiration, mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, uh, you know, giving them a, a rightful chance uh, based on merit uh, to really make their way in life. Uh, I think there is ample opportunity in India, mm -hmm. uh, in the private and in the public side to do a lot of good, uh, mm -hmm. but we have to make it um, accessible for people. Uh, and not something which is a really, really tough journey because people will then just turn their eye and say, oh, I don't want to do this. And that's actually what's happening in our country. And all we are exporting talent uh, because they feel more valued somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gidam, before I come to you, I have one question for Dr. Moore uh, on this issue. So Dr. Moore, you have written more than once uh, somewhere that India has reacted with great alacrity. Uh, to the external demand for technical workforce, right? You know, especially in, in computers and, and coding and so on and so forth, and virtually captured the global market in some meaningful way. Uh, that was purely as a reaction to the external forces. And you have also implied, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. You have an opportunity to uh, correct me. Um, you have also implied that we could do that in India uh, you know, and, and, and tap into this kind of a talent, human resource talent we have. How come we have not done that? Uh, how is it that we haven't done that uh, or replicate that in, in, the, in the health sector? I mean, there are a number of strategies, you know, we took in the technical side, but not all of which carry over necessarily on the healthcare side, because, you know, the quality standard has to be much tighter, etc. But at a principal level, you know, and we, we keep talking about the US. Yes, US has a number of challenges, but let's look at many countries, Chile, UK, how have they dealt with their human resource problems, right? One of the opportunities that they have is, and India has a terrific tax system, direct taxes system, is to, in, to implement what we call income contingent loans, ICLs. What they allow you to do, if you get admission into a school, you automatically get money. Right? And the recovery happens to the tax system once your income crosses a certain uh, level. Right? Uh, and India, you know, we have technology is not a problem. We have human resources, not a problem. We also don't have the problem of capital. We have deep uh, equity markets, deep debt markets. Now, we need to make sure that we have quality control. But, you know, today what we have done is created a, a, a scarcity. You know, I, I see on the Twitter feed all these young MBBS doctors struggling with the NEET exam. And, you know, why? Why must somebody have 105% in order to get admission? And Harvard Medical School has a 20% admission rate, right? So clearly we need to solve this issue. And I would say, you know, the world is aging. We have a young population. Mm -hmm. To me, why must Cuba be the only country that exports enormous number of doctors? Right? People speak about uh, you know, um, doctors without borders in Ebola. Actually, Cuba sent one of the largest contingent of doctors to deal with Ebola. Why can't we do that? Right? Now, I think we have all the makings of it. We just need to sit down and figure this out. Uh, and good thing about India is you know, one challenge of being a laggard is you're a laggard. But the benefit is there are 80 other countries you can learn from and, and say, okay, I'm going to pick that from here. I'm going to pick that from here. I'm going to figure this out. And mm -hmm. I think most of what we have been talking about, somebody or the other somewhere has figured out how to do it well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, Dr. Gidam, it looks like it all comes down to you. Why can't you solve our problem on human resources? Yeah, it's a very, very broad question, if I can say so. Sure. Uh, how do we handle HR in the healthcare? So I, 
and I, I don't think that we can say ki, okay let us uh, start focusing on frontline workers we can take care of doctors later no it's not going to be like that we have to ensure efficient and proper utilization of every single workforce that we have so we can't allow md medicine doctor to spend his time precious time in treating simple flu like illness which can be better taken care of by say a good nurse or mm-hmm. at the most a gp so i would like to focus on frontline workers we have 650000 villages big number and we are not going to have doctors in all of them uh, in coming few decades at least so we have to have good uh, cadre of frontline workers who can treat simple you know Uh, cholera for example or other diarrheal diseases ors can save lives and it doesn't require a doctor to give that uh, oral rehydration solution or uh, early detection of some of the commonest cancers can be done by frontline workers so that is one area which we must focus on and we cannot neglect obviously on developing and coming out with more and more number of doctors while taking care of the quality as well oh i i am aware of the regulatory issues which were discussed and i think we are moving in a better direction if we see the uh, you know very unreasonable regulatory conditions being relaxed but yes after completing five and half years of education and then again spending two years mm-hmm. uh, you know sitting and just uh, this studying for some other that's not a happy scenario i agree with that and i think we we are uh, working in some positive direction the speed of which we need to increase coming to the export i don't see an easy solution how do you say that okay you don't go to us if somebody has an aspiration and uh, yes uh, payment to the doctors or their income levels uh, are we going to match Uh, the way uk or us uh, makes payment so we we probably are ultimately going to have some of them going out but you have to see it in a positive way also in my batch of uh, 200 mbbs i less than 100 went away 190 are there here in india and uh, mm-hmm. serving the people of india but uh, we also have to see it as a statement that india is going to make at a global stage yeah we we are providing the best doctors for across the world to the humanity i have few friends of mine in uh, some backward countries of uh, africa for example you are serving in that particular place but yes i agree that the policies of retention making their life easy and digital health probably is just one of the ways how it can help you know Uh, if i am a fresh mbbs pass out i find it very difficult to establish myself in a metro city forget even a metro city even a tier 2 city tier 3 city because there are established doctors and no new patient is going to come to a, a fresh pass out now with this technology and common interoperable platform he can still stay in a better place and uh, look forward to serving people from backward districts so i think we are going for some going to see some interesting changes which probably will ensure that the doctors can use their skills from the place they want to at the hours that they want to so if you are traveling from place a to place b you are not wasting your one hour you can still earn something by video consultation or something like that so all these things are changing so rapidly and it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how the things evolve but to sum up i mean uh, everybody knows that but just to sum up we need to have more uh, hr and with very strong focus on frontline village level local workers great thank you so much on that very optimistic note i see sneha uh, uh, with a very tough look you know, <laughs> uh, asking me to stop I, as i said earlier uh, i could have we could have heard from you for another 5 or 6 hours i think you you all have brought such or bring such very interesting diverse experience and background uh, so let me first thank you for for the contributions you are making uh, to the health sector in india i am so grateful uh, i am a beneficiary of your work uh, both uh, indirectly and directly so i'm so, and i also uh, follow e- each of you you know in in the uh, in, in what you do so thank you 
Uh, and thank you for supporting our students and participating in this program. Uh, this, it means a lot to us. Uh, and also let me thank the organizers. As I said, and I don't know how many sleepless nights they have organizing this conference, this huge conference. So uh, thank you to our students for uh, doing that. My job is done, Sneha. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, all the panelists and uh... Professor Vishnu, thank you so much for your amazing moderation. I think one of the key takeaways for me was that we need to galvanize joint action and uh, create partnerships between public, private, and uh, people to effectively address the public health issues in India. While great strides have been made in healthcare, uh, there's also an urgent need for increasing focus on women's health, mental health, and also reaching the last mile in uh, public healthcare. Uh, all the attendees, thank you so much for uh, participating in the, sex the session and sending in your questions. We have an excellent uh, lineup of sessions coming up later today. Uh, the next session would be on the state of the state, uh, strengthening India's governance capabilities. And you can find the Zoom link on the chat. Once again, thank you, panelists and uh, uh, Dr. Professor Vishwana, thank you. May I, may I also take this opportunity, sorry, uh, to thank Dr. Vistra. So we had a lot of questions coming up in, but he excellently incorporated the questions in the conversation. And it was it was amazing. I mean, we didn't have to go all the way to a question and answer session specifically, but it was it was flawless, Dr. Vistra. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all the panelists for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. How do we do this? Should we end or? Yeah, leave webinar, I think. Should we end webinar? Should yeah, we? end webinar. Vidhi, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that let's stay on for two minutes so that if people want to use the link on the chat to go to the next session, they can. And then we can end the webinar.